Hello, I'm Dave DePeters, the CEO of the National Repertory Orchestra. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this National Repertory Orchestra educational event. I'd like to especially welcome our 2020 NRO fellows. We wish you could be here this year in Brackenridge. We're sorry you're not, but wherever you are, we hope you're safe, healthy, and comfortable. This seminar is provided by the, NRO, by the NRO free of charge to all participants and visitors, thanks in great part to our educational sponsors, Alpine Bank, Breckenridge Grand Vacations, Colorado Creative Industries, Pat and Steve Larson, the League of American Orchestras, the Summit Foundation, and the Town of Breckenridge. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button and write your question and we will do our best to convey that question to Teddy as we go through. Uh, there'll be a brief survey at the end of this program. We ask you to please fill this out. It helps us not only make these programs even better, but it helps us gain funding for future programs. Today's seminar will be given by maestro Teddy Abrams. An unusually versatile musician, Teddy Abrams is the widely acclaimed music director of the Louisville Orchestra and the music director and conductor of the Brit Festival Orchestra, as well as, 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 well as an established pianist, clarinetist, and composer. And what else do you do, Teddy? So, um, a tireless advocate for the power of music, Abrams continues to foster interdisciplinary collaboration with organizations, including the Louisville Ballet, the Center for Interfaith Relations, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the Speed Art Museum, and the Folger Shakespeare Library. And on a personal note, Teddy and I went to the same alma mater, the Curtis Institute of Music, and had the pleasure to uh, study with a truly brilliant mind and unique voice, Ford Lollerstadt. And I look forward to speaking with you about Ford. <laughs> a wonderfully unique person. Anyway, so ladies and gentlemen, Teddy Abrams. Well, it's so great to be here uh, under these very unusual circumstances. Every, everybody keeps saying this is such a crazy time, but at what point do we just kind of stop saying that maybe the previous time was the crazy time at this point. I mean, I'm starting to kind of feel that. Um, but here we are. I'm so glad to be speaking with you all. And I, I miss NRO. I was so disappointed not to, not to be there actually conducting. And last year was so much fun. I mean, it was really an absolute highlight of the, of the summer. Um, and uh, it was, David, was anybody there uh, last year that's also part of the, the program this year? Or is that? Yes, we did have a number of musicians, actually. I think there were probably eight or nine that were coming back that would have been here this year in 2020 that were here when you were here. And, you know, your last year, I mean, this is one of the things I actually wanted to talk about. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to step in with a, with a question, which is, um, you know, we, we called you. You, were, you came in for um, Bramwell Tovey, who, who had gotten ill. And... Um, you came in and did not change the program at all. And we, we were doing Rhapsody and you were play conducting Rhapsody in Blue, American in Paris, and this Grant Still piece. And did you know that piece before we I, you said, I yes, I'll do it? Or did you just say, what the heck? Yeah, I just thought this is a great piece to have on the program. Uh, you've already programmed it. Let's just do it. I, I uh, Fortunately, because of the certain elements of my training. I'm used to very rapidly studying a piece or, or learning it. Uh, and it, it was actually super fun. I've never, uh, never actually done it, but, but I knew of it, especially anybody, you know, programming American music, you start to get you know, familiar with not only the, the living composers that you love, but also a lot of the composers from the past that have been um, underrepresented and uh, I, was, I was really thrilled to get to do that. But by far, that was, you know, not a stressful experience to have to prepare that quickly compared to having to play the Rhapsody in Blue. To play conduct it is, I, I mean, I, I get so uh, nervous to play piano in the context like that, um, especially with all the amazing NRO musicians just sitting right there. I mean, it's incredibly challenging and awkward experience. And I do, I keep doing that kind of thing because, um, you know, it, it keeps people like me humble. Uh, conductors don't have enough uh, opportunities in their lives to stay humble. I would say that's a big, a big thing here. And uh, the humility 
of understanding the challenges of, of actually playing music at the level that we, we expect and demand um, and are so lucky to, to have it, 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 you know, especially with, with musicians at NRO, but in all of our major professional orchestras, to, to maintain any connection to that, you have to remember what that's like. And it's one of the reasons why I, I keep putting myself out there uh, as, a, as a performer, because I find that incredibly Im important as a, as a tie to the physicality of making music. And once you start getting too far into the theoretical zone, it's very easy to forget the, the, the mental and physical challenges that come with just playing your instrument at, at that level that, that you're expecting it. And, and it's easy to divorce those, those two realities, you know, the, the, the musical goal or the musical vision from the actual physicality. And that's when conductors can start going off into dangerous God territory, as I call it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I try and, you know, I, look, con conducting is such a weird thing. I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about it later, but you know, I, I often have a lot of snark and uh, criticism for the for the profession because I think any reasonable human being who happens to also be a conductor needs to just remember how, in addition to all the beautiful and incredible things conductors can do, how absurd it is that this person walks out on stage, gets the special bow to themselves, turns their back to all the people who have paid money to be there, and then gyrates and jumps around for uh, a while while not making a single sound. I mean, I think that the, the comic element of that, has you have to keep that in mind. If you, if you go too far away from just remembering that there is, a, there is a certain amount of ridiculousness associated with that, then your head, there's no stopping how big it can blow up at, you know, as a, as a balloon-like kind of uh, you know, mental case. And I, I, I try and prevent that from happening because I really, really don't like it when, when you know, conductors d divorce themselves from, from the realities of what it really means to, to make music. So I, just, I guess I just started this whole thing off with a giant attack on the, on the profession. And, and I mean that lovingly, I mean that lovingly. Look, believe me, throughout this conversation, we'll have plenty of time to attack conductors. I, and I look forward to it. Yes, yeah. Um, let me start off with, though, the, the, how did you, you know, it, it, your, your career sort of, it's like, um, it reminds me of the Old Testament, like Teddy begot clarinet, which begot piano, which begot, you know, conducting. What was, what was your lineage there? How did, where did you start? How did you get rolling and how did you ultimately get into conducting? Well, I, I started off just like, you know, a lot of kids, I wanted to play the piano. Actually, it was very self-motivated. We had a piano in my house and uh, I always wanted to, to improvise on it. And my parents said, okay, then we'll just get you lessons. And uh, I wasn't a remarkable pianist, I was, you know, whenever that was age four, I was fine. I was perfectly fine. I, I loved the improvising. I begrudgingly did the exercises, but I, I wasn't some, you know, crazy virtuosic pianist. You know, I wasn't the, the Yuja Wong of the piano, let's put it, put it like that at that age. Weirdly though, uh, when I was eight and I was in third grade, the, the school that I went to actually started an elementary school band program that year. And I signed up like everybody else in, in, in the school. And I can't explain, I'm sure we all have the, these, these weird ex experiences at some point in our, our lives, but uh, on day one of band, I, I was playing clarinet. I wanted to play saxophone back then. It, that was the instrument, that was the Bill Clinton era. Saxophone was the cool instrument, but my hands were too small. And besides clarinet's more versatile anyway, uh, to some extent. And uh, I remember that band instructors put the instrument in your mouth. So I did. And uh, everybody was squawking away. I don't know why, but you know, uh, pretty much within a week or two, I'd finished the band book. And, and I mean, it was just weird. For some reason, that instrument aligned with who I was, I guess, or there was some physicality that, that allowed me to, 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 to play the clarinet um, in that way. I, don't, I can't explain it really. It didn't work like that with the piano, that's for sure. That took the hours and hours and hours of shedding and the clarinet was just a weird case. And then, when I was uh, nine years old, uh, I went to my first orchestra concert, and I tell this story kind of frequently, but uh, and I can even show you the, the evidence of it, but it was the first time I'd ever seen a, a live orchestra, and uh, it was a very safe situation. It was an all Gershwin concert outside in San Francisco, the San Francisco Symphony playing their summer series, and 
I think my, my parents probably thought, yeah, we'll try the outside concert, see if, see if, you know, my brothers and I liked it. But, but I was absolutely transfixed from five seconds in. And I decided right then and there that that was what I was going to do with my life. I was going to be a conductor. And it was very clear. It was not, it was not the kind of thing where you think, oh, that would be really fun. I bet that's fun. It was, it was, I'm going to do this. I will do this some way or another. And that night when I got back, I wrote a, a very, very long, probably seemingly very crazy fan letter to MTT, who was conducting that concert. And I went on and on about Mozart and Beethoven this. I mean, it was like probably my best friends at that point uh, because I was, I was a, not the easiest kid in that, socially. But uh, anyway, I asked for conducting lessons. I just, I just went all out. And uh, in fact, I, I never expected to hear back from him based on my other celebrity letter experiences. And uh, two weeks later, I got this beautiful letter uh, that MTT had written to me. And I have it, it's hanging in my bedroom right now. I was gonna, I was gonna you know, bring this in there, but then I realized it's kind of a mess. But, but the letter hangs on the side of my, uh, my bedroom wall so that every morning it's a reminder that somebody did something for me that they did not have to do. That somebody read this crazy nine-year-old's letter asking for conducting lessons and took the time and the effort and the care to say that, that they could actually change somebody's life. I'd consider that a, a life-changing moment right there, just a, a seemingly simple thing as a letter. And there, there is a, a core to that story that, that, that there was an understanding that in, in MTT's case, his role in that moment was far greater than conducting a concert. He, he actually connected with a human being and, and changed, as I said, the course of my own, not just musical life, but every, everything uh, that I was, was experiencing as a, as a young person. And uh, I was very lucky. Uh, I started taking clarinet very, very seriously and uh, started playing in San Francisco Symphony Youth Orchestra, which is a part of the San Francisco Symphony. And this is probably a longer story than you ever intended. But uh, I, I had a very unusual situation with a variety of teachers. In fact, as a as an 11 year old or a 12 year old, I was flying back and forth to, to New York and uh, I would live for a period of time with this guy named Kalman Opperman, who was like this clarinet guru, but he was, I don't know, like 800 years old and lived in this this uh, apartment uh, in the right, it was he, he lived there so long that even though it was in the, you know right off of Central Park West and and Sixty Fifth, it was he owned it since it was actually like the, the the arts district there, and I'd go but basically he was a crazy teacher, brilliant and amazing in a lot of ways, and you know but he he'd lock me in a room and say come out when you can articulate this a quarter note equals you know one hundred sixty or something like that, and and that's not really a great environment. I'm pretty sure these days that probably wouldn't have been, you know, I, I wouldn't have lasted for a long time, but essentially there was a little bit of a, of a breakdown in that, that situation. And uh, my parents didn't know what to do. They're not musicians. And they approached, uh, they approached the San Francisco Symphony Youth Orchestra, Alistair Neal, who was the conductor there at the time and said, what do we do with this kid? He's doing practicing clarinet all these hours a day and obviously really serious things composing. And, and Alistair said, listen, I think you should talk to MTT. You've maintained you know, some correspondence with him. And you know, it's kind of unusual for a 12 year old to go and, and meet with him, but we'll set it up. And Michael did meet with me and, and uh, became a mentor from that point on. And he'd see me you know, every, every few months or so and I'd play for him. He set me up with incredible teachers change the trajectory from one that was really uncertain. And, you know, when you don't have other musicians kind of in your, in your life, or you don't grow up in a musical family, everything seems like a dark path forward. There's no clear uh, understanding of how to navigate these waters. And so he, he really uh, provided that sense of family and uh, brought me out to the New World Symphony, I think the first time I was 14. And uh, that remains one of my favorite memories because, you know, they're used to, to Michael's um, brilliant and sometimes kind of crazy ideas. And, when he announced that this, you know, a young conductor from San Francisco is going to be leading a session of uh, the Brahms Academic Festival Overture. And then I walked out, you know, like the ultimate nerd apparel. And, you know, it was just a quite, it was a scene. And uh, anyway, uh, I, was, I was so fortunate to have regular uh, sessions at, at New World, which, you know, most, most young conductors just, you know, you don't have that, that kind of orchestra to, to experiment with and to have a safe situation where you can totally fall on your face all the time. 
and uh, eventually made my way to the San Francisco Conservatory. I did a couple years there. Uh, I graduated very early and then went to Curtis for, um, for uh, conducting and had three years there of, uh, you know, it's kind of a choose your own adventure situation at Curtis. It's, uh, you, you can really build whatever, whatever kind of education you want. And uh, I was fortunate to be able to do that and find the teachers that, that really aligned with what, what I was looking for. And it was such an inspiring place. Oh, that's great. When you were there, was Ed Aldwell there or he, was he still alive at that time? Ed was there. Yes. I, uh, I loved Ed Aldwell. Uh, I mean, that was the thing about Curtis is that the faculty outside of your area of study were all so great. And I was shocked by how many, especially, you know, conductors or, or composers would stay in their own lane. And so I was always just trying to, to, to dialogue with and, and interface with all these other teachers and the, the other students that were way outside the norm. Uh, because I thought, as, if I'm here, I might as well be playing for, you know, Pam Frank and doing, you know, uh, uh, you know by, by private uh, sessions with uh, Ford Lollerstead and all these, these legends. And so I just put myself out there as much as I could. And uh, I, I, I'm grateful for it because those were, they were high pressure situations. And uh, I, I learned so much from teachers that weren't, they weren't conducting teachers, they weren't piano teachers, they were just music teachers. Right, me. right. And that, that was, I mean, the, the, the theory, te you know, teachers that when I was there, was, you know, basically Ford and Ed. And, um, you know, it was never about theory. It was never about the reason for theory. This is a two chord. This is a five chord. This is a six, four inversion. It was always about, and therefore you play it like. You know, it was always, there was always a performance aspect to it because these guys were tremendous performers and had brilliant minds. And um, so with Ford, because he was a theory teacher when I was there and he sort of changed his trajectory and you were part of that movement into sort of like a more of a mentorship sort of a free thinking role that he had. What, what did you work on with him? And what, what, what are some of the things you took away from, from working with, with Ford? So just so every, everyone knows, we're talking about you know, Dr. Ford Lollerstedt, who's been an incredible uh, fixture at Curtis, like nearing his 50th year teaching there. Um, and I think he started teaching there, he was like 21 or something to that effect. And he used to be head of the department and also at Juilliard. And I mean, one of the great minds in, in music and not just, not just from a theoretical perspective, but as a human being and extracting the, the, the parts of how music work that then relate to the much bigger picture of, of how, you know, the world works. And I mean that in a, in, a, in a rather remarkable way. He had such a huge influence on me. I remember my first class with, with Dr. Lawrence it was, I mean, it was like straight out of the Dead Poet Society. Uh, we got to the class and this was supposed to be advanced score reading for conductors and composers. We're supposed to be playing scores on the piano. And it was, a, it was supposed to be an hour long class. And it, 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 the first class lasted two and a half hours and mostly was a discussion about Brokeback Mountain. I'm not sure we played any music, but it was about Brokeback Mountain and how, I remember this, he talked about how that access to the great, the, the pit of tragedy into which all human beings put um, their kind of inability to understand each other. And we filled that over the years through the lens of art. And it was, I mean, it was just like the most inspiring thing. And, uh, and then quickly we realized that, you know, he's been, he's been working on this lifelong uh, study of how music and language connect with each other. And he's, I mean, he's a genius, genius, genius in that sense. Like he's like a Noam Chomsky kind of guy. Uh, and he's finally, he's been working on this book and he's been able to demonstrate when people say music is the universal language, it's just a catchphrase. It's a, it's a little idiomatic, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's just more or less a tagline for trying to explain how great music is. And it's not really backed by a lot of science. He's put the science into it because he can actually show how the abstraction of musical information is equivalent to the same way that the brain abstracts the, the very essence of linguistics, the very essence of, of communicative language. And he can show scientifically that, I mean, it's crazy. This is a gross oversimplification, but he could show that the, the very basis of consonance and dissonance and counterpoint, therefore, um, is essentially the same system 
that allows us to understand that the, the concept of, of structural nouns and verbs and the context for how language works on a syntactical level. And uh, I mean, when you hear him, you know, do a giant lecture on this. And finally, he gets to the point when he explains that the passing tone has the equivalence in the human you know, neurological response as a verb does between two other structural elements in a sentence. It's like one of those moments where you can't, you can't even believe you know, that you're in the presence of somebody like this. And the funny thing is you'd think that somebody that, you know, traditionally oriented, you know, somebody really coming at it from a specific perspective would, would tow the, the party line of, of, you know, the classical banner. And, and it's, he's anything but that. His whole philosophy is that because music comes from a place of real language, that if you can speak extemporaneously, like we're doing right now, I mean, we're utilizing syntax and, and, and structural uh, comprehension that, that underlies uh, the specific meaning of what we're trying to get across. If that's true for language and music follows the same systematic approaches as language itself, then you should be able to create music extemporaneously, which is why Ford is one of the greatest improvisers on the planet. Absolutely. He can improvise preludes and fugues totally from scratch and giant organ works. Um, and it's, it, that was this, this game changer moment for me when I realized improv was not just a nice thing you sprinkle in, it's the generative force in music. And even even the most finessed, perfect, you know, compositions, the you know, your Mahler eights and your Wagner operas and and your you know Stravinsky ballets are all in the end a product of that same sense of of um, of generative music making. Uh, so anyway, that I could go on and on as you've probably seen, but it, it changed my life. I mean, it really did. Believe me, I wish we could go on and on, but I have some questions I need to get to you. So I apologize for this. We're, we're going to change uh, going to change directions a little bit, but thank you so much for that. That you know, it's great. It's great to have this conversation. Um, you know, our musicians are uh, you know have have a lot of things on their minds right now. Obviously, COVID being a big portion of it, but of course, the sort of the grander thing even before COVID hit was you know. What am I going to do with my life? Well, how am I going to get a job? How am I going to support myself? How am I going to move on with uh, this thing that I love, but I'm not sure I'm going to make a living doing? So this, the first set of questions we have are uh, to discuss um, auditions. Yes. And so um, I'm wondering if you would share your perspective on orchestral auditions, just in sort of a, a general way, and then we'll sort of drill down a little bit. Yeah. Oh, what a tricky subject. I mean, so my, my, I flip between so many different understandings of how auditions work. And of course, I'm sure many of you read the article that Tomasini wrote in the Times about ending blind auditions. And, you know, I understand the perspective of the blind audition and the need to create an incredibly fair environment and, and the positive influence that that's had on, on so many elements of, of orchestras. Uh, but also the system that has allowed us to not take into account the humanity and this larger sense of who people are uh, because we are colleagues on levels that, that are so much broader than you know, the, the, the process of, of just simply being able to execute your, your, the musical side. And I know that, that the tenure process is designed for that, but you know, that's not, yes, it works to a certain extent, but it's a huge check and balance situation rather than a part of what, what people are looking for up front. So, I mean, I, I would really love to see, see, I guess the, the underlying issue here is that that system that we have right now is so set in stone that we're not even able to try other things. And I think that's the problem. The, 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 even the, the idea that there might be a better system or an alternate system or a system that, that allows orchestras to be more who they want to be could never even be on the table. It's that mentality, I think, that's so problematic. And, and if, if really the system that we have right now is best, or maybe it's best for one organization uh, and not another, we never get to experiment with that because once we develop a structure in the orchestra world, we're so tied to it. We can't undo it. We can't try different things. And, and 
I understand the complexities around that, but these are conversations that really need to be to be had. And I think uh, you know it's 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 not only just a, a broader industry topic, but it's an individual topic. Not every city and not every orchestra's profile is going to demand the same things for for, for personnel and where that. Where, where that will take orchestras in this next era. Uh, and I think we need to, to think about this uh, and, and have open conversations where if somebody suggests something that's very different than what the standard has been, that they don't get yelled at and say, how, how dare you even, you even suggest that or feel like they, you know, that they might have that reaction even if it's not going to happen. Um, you know, for me, the most important thing, especially in this era of such remarkable quality from young musicians. I mean, really, the quality at, at auditions, whether it's the Chicago Symphony, the Louisville Orchestra, or, or, or really, you know, any large professional institution, the quality that we're, we're getting is pretty exceptional. Um, and for me, the thing is always about who are the, the human beings that can build the, the orchestra, build the, the community, build the mission that you're trying to accomplish. Um, it's the, the objective element is actually a small part when so many people are able to play so well. And yes, the musical profile and certain stylistic things, you know, are, are very important. They're very important to me. They're very important to the orchestra's uh, own approach. But the bigger picture of who are the citizens that we want to have, uh, because you don't, th this, is, this is the most critical thing that we, we can do is, is, the, is the choice of personnel. And if, if we don't think about that holistically, then it, it, we're left, at, there's so much chance and so much fate that I think um, is very problematic for building the kind of orchestras of the future that, that, that we need to meet the challenges of the future. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think, again, I'm not suggesting specific things that, that can be done per orchestra. I'm suggesting that the conversation be had as to what we're really looking for, so that we align our audition process with our values and our mission. And so much of the time, we sacrifice values and mission for conform, conformity. We say the whole country has to do it like this. Everybody has to do it like this. Uh, and now that's off the table. And then this other idea that, well, for it to be on the table, we need something. You know what I mean? Like that, that's a bargaining chip. I think we have to walk away from that and work together because this is, this is a tremendous opportunity when we, when we have a, you know, a spot to fill. I know I'm going on a soapbox a, a, a little bit here, but I think it's so, so critically important um, that, that, that we be honest with ourselves about what we're all looking for together. And that may be the most impartial, fair process that, that, that takes into account nothing but the sonic element. That may be what we come up with. But we shouldn't just assume that 40 years after that process was initiated or 30 years after it was initiated, that we're all still on the same page around the country in every single city, every single orchestra size, budget, and style. So I get, I, that probably doesn't help with anybody's actual auditions. Um, you know, obviously, I think that, that developing relationships with, if you're really interested in an orchestra, even given the blind audition situation, we should do what anybody would do for any job that's in a, in a kind of normal profession. You develop relationships with people. You learn about that orchestra's history and style. You contact people that are, are influential there. You get to know, you know what their aesthetic is. I think that all combines to a sense of, of, of place and a sense of, uh, of how you would fit in to the whole. I think that's actually really important. And uh, it's not just I'll you know, schedule 10 auditions and, and uh, show up and you know, do exactly what I do. Let's think about what are, what are they trying to accomplish in Louisville and how does, is that the right fit for me and how might that inform um, you know, how, I, how I actually prepare for this, even if it is purely sonic. All right. That's great. Certainly, it's, um, you know, just because it was working or maybe it wasn't even working 40 years ago, but just because we've been doing it for the last 40 years doesn't make it the right decision. It just makes it the decision that nobody's moved forward from. And I would hope that these, this time especially uh, allows us to look from a new lens, through a new lens. Well, and, and frankly, okay, I, I, one other soapbox I feel strongly about is we're not using technology to make this any easier on ourselves. And asking, you know, harpists and tubists and double bass players to fly around the country for, for you know, cattle call first round auditions, when we could be doing first round auditions by 
Zoom or Skype or something like that. Uh, there could be really great ways of, of, you know, either recruiting people for that and bringing them to, to, to you know, advanced rounds of doing first rounds uh, using tech. And there are ways to make it fair to some extent. I'm sure we could, we could be creative with that. There are, you know, they could be managed by the staff so people don't know who's playing. Just to eliminate this insanity, because frankly, asking asking somebody to, to fly across the country, show up at 7 a.m. for a warm-up room where 15 other people are all warming up loudly on their excerpts to play for five minutes at 8 a.m. doesn't resemble any element of the job that I know of. And I mean, it's, it, it would, it, you, know, you know what I mean? Like it's, it, it would be like a, a, you know, a totally different test for, for any other job uh, that, that's not, you know, it's like under these extreme conditions. Right. And I, I think that we, we should start thinking about the circumstances where we ask people to, to, to participate in these auditions because a lot of them are really absurd. And so what you get are like the, sometimes the, the, the people that can just sustain the circumstances. They like, you know, maybe they, they're like the person who climbed uh, whatever it was in uh, the, that, that documentary, you know, climb, he doesn't have any adrenaline response. El Capitan, you know, yeah. like the, the, it, and so you're weeding out a lot of people that otherwise could be amazing for the job, but maybe their constitution and their, their, um, you know, they're just their physical being doesn't support that kind of work. And that work doesn't resemble the kind of work we're going to ask them to do. Well, we have, um, th thank you for that. We, we have uh, Mina Hong is, is here with us and um, she's going to um, turn her, there she is. And Mina has got a question for you about auditions. If you wouldn't mind, Mina, go ahead. I have a few questions actually. Right. So I wanted to ask during the audition process what the panel is generally looking for and if um, they prioritize certain aspects of the audition and if those priorities uh, differ throughout the different uh, rounds. Yes, I think they, they do for sure. Um, and I think that, you know, you have all of your kind of sad to say it, but, but you, in, in any orchestra, you're going to have your person that just sits there tapping to see if you counted every beat in the rest, you know, and to, to, you know, they're gonna, you're going to have your, your crazy, you know, rhythm czar. And there are people, I will say this, that a lot of panels have people with individual ticks and, and they can't get over those ticks. If you, you know, uh, uh, you land on one of those issues for them, they, they may be uh, uh, unmoving no matter how well you, <laughs> you fly the rest of the time. You have to be prepared for that, which is one of the reasons why thinking about, um, you know, all those core elements, there, there are certain things about, you know, vibrato uh, or intonation or rhythm that, that, that can be, you, you know, trigger points for, for individuals and trying to at least mitigate those circumstances to the best of your ability is really important. Uh, I do think people, people always are, People are always attracted to a beautiful sound. A, a truly beautiful sound, like a, a remarkably beautiful sound, can give you a lot of leeway. It buys you a lot in the other departments. Uh, because so many times when you're, when you're there, the rooms aren't great to begin with, and, and a lot of people are just, you know, they're so focused on execution, that when you hear somebody with a, with a remarkable sound, that always just lights up and goes, wow, that was, that was beautiful. That wasn't just another, you know, 95 execution, but it, that like had something special in it. When people also do something that, that there's like a special quality to their music making, where they took a risk or they, they had something to say that wasn't annoying, because I think it is, you know, like somebody's trying to like impress you and it's so obvious, that doesn't work. But when some, somebody has a voice, in addition to a special sound, a real voice that comes through, even in their ridiculous, you know, three minutes of a solo piece or whatever it is, that also puts you up in any round because it's so, it's not what you're hearing most of the time. You're mostly hearing a kind of Olympics-like execution situation. So those two things, you know, they, they, and then I'd say finally, this is the magical element. I don't know if this really answers your question, but I have this belief that if you really want the job, you're going to, it, you're, it's, it affects somehow the way it sounds. There's some weird thing, like you're, you're gonna win the job that either you're so unprepared or like you're so, you weren't even didn't want that job, that that's the one you win or you're so over it that you, you kind of have the, the screw it all mentality and that's the one you win. 
But often when it's like, this is the one I want so badly. This is the perfect job for me. It's my hometown and my boyfriend or girlfriend lives there. Be perfect. There's something, some kind of like desperation that comes out. And I, it's a weird, like it's an extra frequency that only the, maybe only the dogs can hear. But I, I can tell you it's, it happens time and time again. And so I think you have to adopt one of those two attitudes of screw it. I'm making this music just for me or, um, or whatever. One of those two attitudes can really help so that you don't get that. I want it. I want it. I want it. Because somehow that's maybe it's like even dating or something like that. When somebody really wants this kind of unattractive, maybe I'm not an expert on that, but I do. It does come in and into play with auditions for some reason. Yeah. So uh, another thing I'm wondering is, is there something that you look for in particular during these auditions that another conductor may not be looking for? I, I, yeah, I think that everybody has their, their kind of specific approach. You know, again, for me, I'm trying to hear through to somebody's musical vision, like their, their real capabilities um, as, a, as a musician, not just as an instrumentalist. And it's very, that's one of the reasons why I kind of, you know, railed against the system a little bit, because it's so hard to do that, given our, our circumstances. But, but it, it does come through uh in, in in certain ways i'm always trying to hear is this person is this person uh bringing something that seems unique or or has an actual perspective or, a, or their own vision for how this music can sound even in the most basic of excerpts and, and when you hear that like that is something that i try and and immediately uh uh you know capture or, or, or grab onto and follow and track that throughout the rest of the audition process uh because those are the people that are going to keep me inspired. Yeah, having an orchestra of you know great automatic players that can just execute, execute that that's exhausting. What what you know if 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 they're not bringing a creative vision to it, then you know those aren't the colleagues that I I, I prefer to work. With. I prefer to work with people that have that sense of we want to be part of that that vision. We want to contribute to. We want to inspire you and go back and forth and have a virtuous cycle. So I'm looking for that if you can find it. But it is yeah. it is hard in 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 uh, you know the, the Beethoven six or Mendelssohn scherzo excerpts that I've heard so many millions of times. It's a little hard to sometimes find that level of inspiration in the you know scherzo. Yeah. <laughs> and then I have one last question. Uh, so by the final round, when if it comes down to say like two people, how much does their like own personality, not just in their playing, but like kind of as a person, their personality and attitude affect the final decision of who wins the spot. If this, yeah, if the screen has come down uh, and, and usually when the screen is down, we'll have some elements of people playing together. Often I'll play piano uh, or we'll have other members of the section play, which is so common. I think then you can't help but include that in your decision making. Um, and you do try and think about the objective musical work that they're doing, but the whole point of bringing down the screen was that you could get a better sense for the person. And it's the honor code and you, you have to hold yourself accountable to, to that honesty and, and not letting bias or any you know, background information or anything like that creep in. But if I have the option, that's such a better way of, of doing it for me because um, you get a sense for who your colleague is going to be. This is a social job. This is, this is not a, a factory floor. This is not about just you know purely executing something. This is about how we relate to or We always say orchestra is like a family. How many times have we, we heard that described in donor situations or you know when orchestra you know, or, or they're talking about the nature of what our job is like? Well, you know, it, blind audition is a tough way to add people into families. Families are hard enough without you know kind of that that element. And so it's 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 the, I think that the personality and the resonance that they might have with your aesthetic and your mission is so critical to, to, to take into account. Because otherwise, you, what you end up doing is you end up having the 10 year year or two, so it's two, like we have a two year process, being that, 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 that buffer. And that can be very uncomfortable if you never even took that into account until that moment. And that's, that's really hard for, for everybody. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. You know, Audrey, you're you're here right now. If you wouldn't mind, I know you have a question about auditions as well. While you're here, why don't why don't you just go ahead and, sure. uh, and ask Teddy what you what you're thinking about? Yeah. Um, 
This is pretty big. Um, wondering if you have any advice for aspiring orchestral musicians right now that are facing a total pause in auditions and hiring. Well, there are the two ways of looking at everything going on right now. Um, there's, you know, the people that see this as the, as the most exciting opportunity in a century to, to really have a creative leap for, for our industry. And of course, there's the, the you know, kind of disaster thinking. Uh, both can be true at the same time, by the way. And I actually have my daily up and down. I, I go between being like kind of feeling this exhilaration at being able to build anything and change anything and the desperation at all the unknowns and the legitimate financial realities that either we're, we're already facing or we'll be facing very, very shortly. Um, I think that this is the moment when all the things that you truly want to do are possible. And you cannot rely on the systems that we've all built up to provide that for you. And I, I hate to say that. I am, am such a believer in, in the great institutions that when they're really firing on all cylinders, have, it can be so much greater than the sum of their, their parts. You know, they really are incredible. But right now, this is a moment for creativity and entrepreneurship and innovation. And I hate to say that because those words are just thrown around so much. And now every school has some innovation course and a community engagement course, this and that. But ultimately, you know, you, nobody can teach you to do this. You can, you can get some kind of training for a particular side of, of, of you know, how to make an ask of a donor, how to write a grant proposal. But, but only you can know what you have to offer the world musically. There is a place for everything that, that we can do. There is a place for our talent. I believe that so deeply because, you know, th th there's a reason that ever since you know, the beginning of re recorded history, there's been some kind of musical part or, or cultural life in all these societies. No matter how crappy life got for human beings throughout history, they have engaged in cultural activity because it's the thing that allows them to feel human. It's a thing that allows them to share in, in the humanity that is the overarching part of our story. And again, I know this is getting way more philosophical than you may, may have intended, but the point is that the, the underlying thing that we can do, that what we have to offer as the bards of, of the world and the, you know, the storytellers and the music makers, that no matter how bad things get, people desire that and crave that and they need that. It's a reminder of their humanity and no matter how the, the, much the economy might tank and how many institutions might fold. And we, we have to be honest with ourselves, that will happen. It, it has already started to happen and it will continue to happen. But what we have as human beings, way deeper than any association with an institution, is that that's an eternal part of the species. And it's a matter of, of looking within ourselves and figuring out what we really have to offer. And what we have to offer is not principal oboe of an orchestra or section second violin. That's not what we really have to offer. That's an, that becomes an important part of our lives and our careers. And yes, our money making, which we have to, we should not be shy about those needs. But what we really have to offer as a creative artist is far deeper than that. And that need is just as strong, probably stronger, because in, in times of, of crises, people are seeking the reminders of their humanity. And uh, what would I what would I offer as specific advice? I mean, the people that can, the people that can tunnel through what's happening right now and match up their creative potential with things that are just a day ahead, a week ahead, a month ahead of where the world is, they, they'll, they'll be able to do anything. They really will. And now that's the hard part is actually doing that because if everybody could see one month ahead or a week ahead, yes, I mean, that, yeah, that would be great, but that's not how it works. But we all have that possibility. We all have that potential. And you can see it with so many different, you know, I, I hate that in this era, we just kick up like a, you know, a, a tornado, you know, one new uh, artistic phenomenon, and then we drop it for the next day and the next day and the next day. That's how we're, we're operating right now, given the, the, the technological profile. But still, the people that are able to, to, to accomplish something in these times are the ones that 
they knew what they had to offer. They believed in what they had to offer and they saw that it was something that the world needed too. And they matched those two things up. And, uh, that's what I'd be doing. That's what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to do it on behalf of an institution. Like I'm trying to do it on behalf of the Louisville Orchestra. Because again, I do believe in the power of, of our institutions. I don't believe in, in tearing everything down. Um, I don't believe in saying that, 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 you know, we're so big and hulking that we're like, the, you know, Stegosaurus, we've got to just, you know, die in the tar pits. I don't believe that. I'm sure that timeline is off. That's probably not, not how it happened. But, but, I, but I really don't believe that. I think the institutions can do the same kind of thing. But if you're not in an institution, there's never been a more democratic era for us to do it as individuals or small groups. And frankly, there is an element. A lot, a lot of institutions are going to go the dinosaur way. They're not, they're going to say that we don't want to be nimble and we don't want to change and pivot. We're going to try and wait this out. And that's going to be very difficult for them. They, that we know how that happens. There's going to be an evolutionary process. And frankly, a lot of the nimble individuals and a lot of the smart thinkers and the people that aren't afraid to fail are going to have so much more at their fingertips. They're going to be trying things and they'll know what worked and what didn't because they, they tried it and sometimes they fell flat on their face. But you know what? In this era, people forget within 24 hours anyway. So you will all have a tremendous advantage um, and, and you'll embrace the things that, that will offer a pathway forward. There are a lot of tunnels through this right now. And uh, a lot of people are gonna say, no, 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 we're too big to go through it. We'll just wait here where it's comfortable. Well, that tunnel is gonna close at some point. This is, the, this is why I'm the, I am an optimist, even though I recognize the difficulties, everything's possible right now. It's like the ground is molten. And if you wanna build something, you gotta do it now because the ground's gonna harden. So there's my, there's my big, um motivational speech <laughs> i hope that helps it does thank you yeah that's great before you two go i just want to in introduce to the audience you both just so everybody knows who's been here it mina hong mina is here a uh, violinist uh for the last few years with the nro and audrey lee and Audrey is also a violinist, and they're uh, both here as part of a string quartet here in Brackenridge, actually, um, performing free outdoor performances uh, throughout July and into August. So thank you all. I think, Audrey, I think we're going to have you back in just a little bit, but um, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew who you, who you were. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> we, have, um, we have a question for you from uh, the Q&A, and um, if I could just, uh, it, it, one last question about auditions here. Um, how can someone auditioning, because you, you had talked about not only wanting to find someone, you know, who fits the family, but find somebody that should find a family that fits them as well. So how can um, someone sort of auditioning flip the table ask questions about the culture of the orchestra to gain a sense of whether that community uh, is a place that they want to join? That's a, that's a great question. And I think sadly that's incumbent upon the institutions to, to give you that opportunity to do that kind of thing. Um, because as it's set up right now, it, you know, you can do your research in advance and you can, you know, call the concert master if you're auditioning for a violin spot or call, you know, a, a member of the wind section if that's your, your, one of your, your, your instruments um, and try and learn about it. But there's not an opportunity for back and forth. And in any other industry where you're hiring, you know, a, a, a professional of some sort, of course, there's that back and forth. You're, you're expected to ask questions of your employer. You know, you don't just... Uh, present something and then walk out of a room, uh, you know, you ask questions. What is the, this place like? How does that work? What are some of your, you know, focal points? And the big thing for me as it relates to that, you know, one of my biggest elements here is the, the orchestras need to serve. Um, I believe in public service. I believe that if we're taking public dollars, we should engage in public service and not lip service to it, not, not taking the money and spending it on all the things we've already done and then telling everybody how great we were for doing education and community engagement. We've got to live by what we, we believe. This is all to say that if orchestras and theater companies and ballet companies and performing arts centers, they always talk about education and community engagement when they present to the public and when they talk about the cool things they're doing. 
So how is it possible that we're hiring members of the orchestra and we never ask one question about their interest in those areas? That's our, those are our biggest values. You see that all over the place. You know, we're committed to serving the community. We serve the community. We're educating. We're doing all this stuff. Yet in the audition process, we don't give a single person the opportunity to present their thoughts and their, their, uh, their vision for, for how to engage with the community. And that, that's, that's a failure. And, and I will tell you in Louisville, we've gotten super, super lucky that all the people we've hired recently uh, have been such great team players. And, and, but, but luck is not a great strategy. Um, <laughs> and, I, and these are the values that are going to make our organizations viable. I, I, I cannot stress that enough. That right now, when you're, de and, you know, I guess this is sort of the seminar element, but right now, when you're dealing with funding, people do not want to hear about how they're going to sponsor a Mahler symphony at this moment. Nobody's going to fund your recording of a Beethoven cycle right now. They're going to ask how you're going to impact the community at a time of extraordinary upheaval and crises, multiple crises that we're all facing. Or th those same funders are going to say, why shouldn't I just give this to the you know, COVID relief fund in town? Why shouldn't I donate this to the research department at, at one of the big medical centers or the university? And if, if we don't give people a chance to, to show what their values are as individuals, it's very hard to you know, make sure that the, the, the people in our organizations share those values. Um, so I guess that's, again, a kind of circuitous way of, of answering that. Yeah, the system's got to change. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, earlier, you had mentioned uh, the um, issues about some, I wouldn't call it stage fright, but you know, you, you get a little nervous when you're, when you have to, especially when you have to play conduct. Um, how do you, more specifically, how do you manage that? And, and uh, you, you know, this, this question came up as part of an audition question, but I think it's sort of a little bit um, universal. In, in managing that? How, how do you go about managing your uh, inner demons? Yeah. You know, I, I obviously, I could use a, a Freud probably, and I've uh, resisted uh, psychoanalysis th t this long and somehow survived, but I probably could, could use it to get a better insight into that. Uh, I, so I, with conducting, weirdly enough, I don't get that, that nervous. I definitely, I feel pressure but more, it's more of, a, of the pressure of like, you know, doing a, a task, like building a building, like not actual anxiety about it, but I feel like if I was managing a lot of different elements in a big building project, it's kind of that pressure. Mm -hmm. Partly because, you know, when you're, when you're conducting, the vast majority of the work is in the rehearsal process. And, uh, you know, that's where, that, that, that's when, you, you know, you, you, all of the, the work that's going to make the concert successful is done. So by the time the concert rolls around, as long as you don't mess up the meters and as long as you, you know, have a good relationship with the orchestra, you know, it's kind of where it is. It, you can inspire it and make it better by being really, you know, energized and, and creative and hopefully, you know, take the performance to the next level between the dress rehearsal and the concert. But there's not that same sense of, oh God, anything could happen that you have when you're an instrumentalist. Like not, not anything could happen. The, you know, the stupidest thing I could do is, yeah, you can mess up a meter or throw your baton, but I mean, that's small compared to like having a meltdown in a concerto. So, um, but as a pianist, I, I think, you know, I, I am, I'm very comfortable as an improviser, which is weird. I can, I can do things as an improviser that I could never play as an actual, like, classical pianist. If I wrote down that stuff and tried to do it, I wouldn't be able to. I just, I, I could practice and practice and practice. It's just beyond me. And so it's very, I'm very comfortable as an improviser. And, you know, even in the Rhapsody in Blue, I did a lot of extended Im Im improvisations for two reasons. One, because I think that's the spirit of the music and Gershwin did the same, but also it calms me down. Like no, knowing that I have a fun improv section coming up is like an anchoring factor. And I mean, who knows, maybe that's why They'll never tell, but maybe Mozart and Beethoven threw their improvs in for the same reason. Um, and, uh, you know, we know that they improvised when they played piano concertos, a significant amount, of course. Um, but I don't know. I don't think I manage it all that well. I fret. And uh, I, think, I think part of what we do, unless you are like the, you know, what's it called? Free solo. Free solo. That was the movie. Unless you're like that kind of, you know, freaky no, you no adrenaline response. Uh, you know, that's a genetic thing I'm assuming, you know, we deal with this for our, for our whole lives. 
I will say I had a, there was a great uh, saying that um, in the San Francisco Symphony Youth Orchestra, our coach, Louis Baez, who was assistant principal clarinet of the, of the symphony, would, would tell us if he was sitting there on stage and he was going to, um, he knew a big solo was coming up, a tough one, and he was super nervous, he would have a routine of calming himself down by saying, you know what, you're never going to see these people again. Just say that. You're never going to see these people. It's totally fine. On the other hand, if he was sitting there um, and he wasn't feeling nervous at all, he'd say, you could make a fool of yourself in front of all these people. And, and it actually reminds me of one of my favorite things. It was very similar to a thing that my, um, my piano teacher would say, which is that as a performing artist, you have to have a, this dueling psychological state where you believe in everything that you're doing. You totally believe in it. You absolutely are convinced of it. And at the same time, you know, everything you do sounds like crap. At the, those two things have to be there. They're, it's like your gy gyroscopes or whatever, you know, whatever they are, and, and, because they, they balance you. They keep you from veering one way or another. And that, that helps me too, to, to, to remind myself, I am so convinced of what I'm about to do, but also, you know what? This is just, this is just the absolute beginning here. And it, I guess if it helped, I wouldn't still get those. But, but then again, I think that's part of the thrill of it. You know, part of, I think, going out there and doing this is the thrill-seeking nature of, of, uh, of what we do. You know, there is a little bit of that because putting ourselves out there on a stage and then playing ligety etudes or, uh, you know, um, even, even the Beethoven Fourth Piano Concerto is categorically crazy. That's, that's nuts. It's unnecessary. We don't have to put ourselves through that stress, but we do it. So I think there is something of, of seeking, there is a thrill element to it and, and an accomplishment element to it that, that, that's part of a cycle. Yeah, there is something that's um, lacking in need for shelter or food or safety and putting yourself out there, something like that. And yet we do it. This is what we do, right? Because yes. there, there's, a, there's also the, the ultimate joy. And, and there is, and I, and I do think that there is that weird symbiotic sense when you've really performed in that magical spirit. I think I've had two, maybe two times in my life where it seemed like everything was clicking. Like there was like a, it felt like there was this um, fluid state between what I was trying to play as a musician or trying to express as a musician and the audience. And, and they, were, they were magical moments. One, I think I was 12 and... It was another a few years ago, but they were, it was like suspended animation. Trying to achieve that it has this, as I said, it's symbiotic. It, it fueled me in a way that it was like, you know, something that, that gave me years worth of inspiration. And hopefully those are the moments that the audience said, of all those hours we've sat in this chair or, or listened to that record and done whatever uh, in the music world, that it all was worth it. That moment was true magic. Nothing else could, could, could accomplish that. That symbiotic quality of, of us being recharged and refueled by those moments and the audience having that genuine, fluid, timeless response. I mean, that, that's part of what we, we live for. And I think that's, for me, a little bit the nerves that I know that that's possible. And I know that it's so hard to do, that, that those, ma those magical moments are, they're that pinnacle of the mountain, which we climb our whole lives. And, and every once in a while we stumble on it, but, there, you know, most of it has just been climbing and we'll have a great show. We'll have a, uh, we'll bomb whatever one, but, but those, those rare moments where we, we look out and the whole thing is clear and we're on the pinnacle. Those are, you know, well, those are, that's what we live for. Right. So um, speaking of, for, of that, we have uh, somebody wrote in a question. Um, they were at your concert. Uh, last year with the NRO and they could see the enjoyment of making music with you and our fellows on the, on the faces of our fellows. Um, and it's a great excitement and joy for the audience to see that connection and that uh, excitement and that joy. How can you get um, the musicians of major orchestras to offer that same kind of pleasure for the audience? Fabulous question. And that is, you know, such a common comment. I mean, I think that we, we forget how our audiences respond so visually to the experience. Uh, and, and, you know, this, because orchestras don't have a situation where they talk about these kind of things, we always default to whatever the, the easiest 
uh, common denominator is. You know, professional orchestras don't get together and say, okay, how are we presenting ourselves visually? How are we looking? What are we, you know, it's like, sign, you know, after we sign the contract and we've done all that hassle, the last thing on our minds is trying to then address our, you know, our visual uh, and, and, you know, our, our physical uh, appearance before an audience. It's not talk about in the collective. We may think about it individually, but the collective doesn't have a lot of opinions about it. And it's so important because as I said, we forget how the audience responds to that so viscerally. I mean, you, you, we've all had that experience where one person moves around a lot of audience member will say, wow, that person was so into it. Or, or somebody will have just a different way of presenting themselves physically. And they'll say, I really was watching them the whole time. We, we all know that. Well, I mean, an orchestra is like a living organism. We should all be living and breathing this music. Um, so I think part of one of my strategies is that I like to have such a challenging weekly situation for orchestras. You know, every week is kind of another big adventure. You can ask members of the Louisville Orchestra, there are no normal weeks. I said, if there's a normal week, then why, why do we have a normal week? What does that even mean? And does that mean easy repertoire week? So basically if I'm conducting every week, some other crazy thing or some project or something that keeps us all on our toes and, and keeps us mentally and physically so active and, and agile that when we get to the concert, there can't be, there can't help but be a sense of joy in the making of this thing. There's never, there should never be a sense of routine. There should never be a sense of, we've done this before, we can, we can just, you know, play it well and that should be enough for everyone. And, and I, I believe really that by keeping everybody super mentally and emotionally busy during the week, that it leads to a concert where everybody is actually there, you know, because they've, they've got to be 100% there. And when you're 100% there, you play like this. You, can't, you don't relax. You're physically not going to be relaxed. I mean, maybe you could be you know, relaxed in a good way, but, but you're, there's a mental acuity that comes with that. And that's where the joy comes in because it's those moments where everybody is 100% engaged. And it's very easy to go on autopilot when it's, when it's repertoire that everybody knows and when maybe an interpretation of that repertoire doesn't challenge anything of our existing beliefs about it. Then, of course... You know, I, I've done even, I, I'm whatever. I think so, I saw somebody ask how old I am. I'm happy to share. I'm 33. Am I 33? I think I'm 33. Although with COVID, who knows in COVID years, I don't know what I am anymore. But, but I've even done, I think I've done like 14 or 15 completely separate weeks of Tchaikovsky 5 at this point. And it's very easy to just seep back into what you know. And if, whether it's traditional repertoire or new projects or living composers, if you can create a paradigm in that week of, of constant um attention and and an engagement then you're going to see that joy expressed and uh i think that's what that 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 element of danger is necessary <laughs> there has to be um that that element that's when the the, the you know the, the the emotions fire and and um you're going to see it. i think one of the, you know when you watch a jazz group playing and everybody says they have their their jazz face on you know that's that's because these people are so locked in you know, you can't zone out. In a, in, in, I mean, how could you zone out in a, in a jazz situation? It's constant, you know, it's conversation. It's constant contribution. You have to be locked into everything that's going on. There's no, okay, I'll you solo for a while. I'll just do the same thing. No, it's, <laughs> it's, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't work that way. And that's why people, okay, maybe they're not, it's not like smiling in joy. Sometimes they're pretty weird drummer phases or bass, bass phases, they call it. But it's, 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 that's a level of like physical engagement with, with the, you know, the, the musical moment. So I, I love for that to be what happens on stage, if it's possible. Yeah, that's great. I'd, um, you know what, I'd like to bring uh, Audrey back in, if you don't mind. Uh, Audrey has a question about programming. Yeah. Would, would fit well with um, what you were just discussing. So uh, Audrey, please. Hi, again. Um, you already kind of touched on this in various ways, but um, with the pandemic, and Black Lives Matter movement of late. Um, I've seen orchestras working with big changes in format and content. And I'm wondering what you think um, of these changes, which do you think are topical or things that will revert back to previous ones? And which do you believe are permanent? That's a great question. We're all confronting that. And, you know, I, I am a big fan of very quick action 
but it has to be honest and meaningful action. And um, participating in kind of, you know, hashtag culture is, you know, well and good, but that's not really going to change things. If you're talking about a systemic situation, uh, being a part of a social media movement that, that is limited in scope is very different than taking a serious look at who you are and what your organization is and asking how have we both, and I, I say this, it's a little uh, awkward to say, it, but you have to look at what are the things that we've done that, that have contributed to the systemic challenges. And also what are the things that we've done that were successful? What really worked? Because if we only say, oh God, every, throw everything out. No, no one has done anything good in this, this arena. That's an error of approval. It's, it means that then we don't learn from the things that we have done that are good and then activate more of that kind of thinking. Um, but I think that, that we have to go through a genuine process of, of thought. This cannot be a knee jerk reaction. It can't just, you know, the next day wake up and, and, uh, you know, I've seen things that are, that seem very, they do seem topical. They seem a little superficial. Just I'm, I've reprogrammed every concert. Now we'll all have a, a, one black composer on it. Well, is that, that doesn't seem like a thoughtful response to what underlies the problem. It's not just a matter of, of programming a black composer on each concert. It's the, the underlying element of su supremacy. And I say that word very, very cautiously because that, that word means so many things in different contexts. But let, in, in our world, you have to look at the underlying situation. And the underlying situation is that from the first day we play music, most of us, regardless of what our background is or even what our age is at this point, have an educational path where we are told that Bach, Beethoven, Mozart were the best composers ever. Brahms and Tchaikovsky were really, really good. Haydn, really, really good. Maybe not quite as great as Bach and Mozart. They were the, really the greatest. And, and then we're presented with all the gods. And those are very much hardened from, with me, age four, when I started taking lessons. And if that whole way of thinking, that ideology leaves no room whatsoever for a, a, an idea of music that's far broader and far more inclusive and far more realistic for how people really listen to music and what it means in their lives, then we're stuck with that. That's the thing that we have to think about undoing because it's really ridiculous that in America, in the 21st century, we continue to tell everybody that the greatest music was made in one specific point in music history, despite that we've been doing this thing for you know, millennia in every possible part of the world. But we still tell people, granted the orchestral world is, you know, is more connected to European traditions, but that doesn't matter. We still tell people that this pantheon exists and it's almost unbreakable. It's, you can't even challenge it. Um, you can, and, and, and that is the element for me that's so dangerous in, in our world and, and it's self-perpetuating because it's just like any, any form of ideology, then the next generation teaches that again. And now I am not saying that, that Mozart and Beethoven and, 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 and Wagner uh, and, and Bach and everybody and Stravinsky, I'm not saying this takes away from them at all. That's this, the whole idea of Black Lives Matter is not saying that, that Black Lives Matter more or, or that all lives don't matter or that police don't make, no, it's saying Black Lives Matter in the context of what's happening right now. And so I'm not saying Beethoven doesn't matter. I'm saying that being from America in the 21st century where we have been, we, we have so many problems in this country. We, we have failed on so many levels as a nation, but one thing that we've done really well is our cultural exports, the, the, the culture that we've been able to share with the planet is unbelievably diverse. It represents an America that, that, that in many ways is idealized from our film world to our music world. This is where we have excelled. And it's really crazy that as musicians, I don't care how you call yourself, classical, jazz, whatever you want to call yourself, but as American musicians, we often just pretend like that's, that's a side part of the story. Like this whole American story um, is, is something that's to the side of the, of the story that we really believe in. And I know this is a super long way of, of getting to this, but as soon as we acknowledge that, that we're all part of the same sense of what it means to be an American musician in the 21st century, with all of its diversity and, and all of its remarkable backgrounds that most of the story has been told by black musicians, let's face it, 
the most of what's come here in, to, to, to America and distinguished our sense of cultural identity comes from black music and black musicians. When we absorb that and say, it's Beethoven and, you know, it's, it's Bach and, and then we include all these other narratives in, in that story and in that pantheon, um, then we're going to really be able to, to think as broad-minded musicians and, and we're all capable of doing that. So for me, you start with that and then you go, how can I be an agent of change and how can I be an agent of inclusivity? And, uh, and then live it. It's, it's more than a statement. You have to live it. And uh, I, I can tell you the things that we've done in, in Louisville, because again, you know, I could just be seen as here spouting off all my ideologies specifically. Um, but it means, what, what it means is looking at every single thing that you do through that lens of does this match my values? And I, I actually find that an incredible, easy way to do it. Instead of trying to program your whole season and then going back in and going, oh, wait, did I have an, enough women in the, you know, did, were there enough black composers? Start with, does this match my values at every point? Every concert, every part of the concert, does this match my values? And if you say, actually, this doesn't really fit with my values, then you have your answer. And everybody's values will be different. Everybody will have a different way of understanding equity and equality. And, and there's not one way to do it. So lots of people and lots of organizations will have a different way of, of expressing their values. But I think it's important to, to, to have that moment of, of, of introspection and thought and learning to find out what our values really are and then check all of your decisions against it. That seems to me to be a good way uh, to, to do it. That was a great question, Andre. Thank you. Very good question very tough. I know it's so hard right now because, you know, this is, this is the fastest moving era that, that humanity has ever seen. And we are, we are in one of the slowest moving industries on the planet. And it's also one where we have not invested in giving individuals a, a voice. Uh, we're seeing that now kicking up. I mean, like the Times interviewing so many individual artists. It wasn't just, what is the opinion of the New York Philharmonic on this? What is the opinion of, you know, the LA Phil on this subject? No, it was really individuals that are, are, are finding a voice, uh, but we haven't invested in that, that platform for individuals. You know, a lot of times it's nope, nope, nope. Keep your head down, play your music, toe the party line. If you're a soloist, don't say anything that's gonna get you in trouble with anybody. If you're in the orchestra, if the committee hasn't authorized it, the orchestra staff, don't say it. And now we're realizing, you know, we, we, we have platforms that are very powerful and it's important that we, we use them. And uh, we're having to learn very quickly. That's, that's, so it's, I, I have so much recognition for how hard that is. What I did is right, right when this all started, because I'm here in Louisville in the middle of, of it, given the, you know, the Breonna Taylor case is the last big case that has no clear trajectory. And we're all waiting for whatever this next situation is going to be. And it's, it's very scary, I can tell you that. Um, but, you know, we recognize we need to be leaders in this, in this field. And so we came up with a set of values. We, we made it, we made it public. And I also then said, personally, here are the things that I'm going to do that I thought resonated with what I, my capabilities are and things that I knew I'm passionate about. So it wasn't just external box checking. And that included everything, you know, we, we had started this, um, uh, rap school where we actually because we, we play a lot of rap for an orchestra um, and uh, we, it's been a training program to, to use Muhammad Ali's life to um, teach middle schoolers and high schoolers uh, how to use his life as an inspiration to create their own raps they're young rappers and, and then they actually get to perform it with the orchestra uh, throughout the season so i've said like let's do that and let's grow that program we've already engaged in in uh, a commissioning program that's really wide ranging and takes in uh, equity and, and inclusivity is a big thing so i'll just i'll make a donation today i'll say you know what my money has some value so i'll put i, I said i'll put twenty five thousand on the table to commission composers of color i'll just do that today that, that's something that comes from a place of introspection, but I can do that now. I don't need to wait around, you know? So it was a list of things like that that came from a moment of, of introspection and then here's what we're actually gonna do. And then you have to just do it. But that's the fun part. The fun part is doing it because every time we've done a project that, that's taken that into account, it's been fulfilling and, and, and uh, absorbing and, and, and felt like we were doing something meaningful, so. Okay, sorry, okay, going on and on and on, but it is such an important question. 
Yeah, it's really inspiring. I, I keep wondering, like, I, I see like the academic, academia part of it, where like we funnel musicians through and create great musicians and the, the institutions, the big orchestras that we're inspiring to be in. And I always wonder like, which will, they're both like, in my mind constricted by uh, money and donors and things like that, that I don't know a whole lot about, but I always wonder which will move first or if they'll both keep each other like, okay, we're gonna go back, so. But what you're saying is really inspiring, so thank you very much. Well, and to that point, uh, yeah, I mean, academia seems to always move a little faster, um, but they've got just as many entrenched elements as, as the orchestral world. My big thing is put the creatives at, at the table. You know, it's so weird that uh, so many of these orchestras employ some of the most brilliant people throughout the year. You know, they'll bring in Yo-Yo Ma as a soloist and they'll get, uh, you know, they'll have a commission from Mason Bates or, or Caroline Shaw or, you know, they'll do a, you know, Wynton Marcellus project. Yet when it comes to actually making decisions about the future of all these institutions, they're not, they're not included. They're beholden to what happens by, you know, behind the scenes. And my whole thing is we've got so many great creative minds. Let's give everybody a seat at the table right now. Um, let's, let's put the creative minds at the table. Let's, let's, let's give them a voice. Um, let's not do a wait and see thing. And then, you know, Augustine Hadley or some you know, brilliant musician and a great thinker, tell him what we've all decided a year from now, once we've sorted it out in the back channels, you know what I mean? Like let's, let's enfranchise all these, these, these brilliant people because we're all on the same side here. And it's funny because if we don't make the right decisions, then where are the Augustine Hadleaks and, and the, the Caroline Shaw is going to get their commissions and performances? They're reliant on us to make good decisions. So rather than, you know, hold everybody away, let's, let's, let's all do it together. And that's what you're going to see big creative change when you have big creative thinking. And uh, it challenges the status quo. And it's very, sometimes it's very hard for people to hear that. But I'll tell you one thing, donors love passion and creativity. The donors that, that I, I talk with, I do, I probably, if, if I'm looking like my eyes are starting to glaze over, it's because I, I've been doing 12 to 14 hours of, of, of development and fundraising a day for the last whatever, however many months. And I can tell you the one thing they all respond to, they say, we love that you're passionate about this. We love that you're not throwing in the towel. We love when people come to us and, and, and they have that, you know, excitement and, and genuine, you know, spirit for what we do. And you're the people to do it. Like everybody, everybody runs development. Everybody runs marketing right now. There's, there's no silo. So, you know, and also creative people are always the ones to inspire change. They're the ones that they've created every big artistic movement in, 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 in history. Think about that. They're always at the forefront. They've changed cities. They've changed countries. They've changed, uh, you know, the way we think about history. So you know, don't sell yourself short. The power is really quite extraordinary. Thank you both. Thank you for a very excellent conversation. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks so much. Thank you. So this really sort of leads to this to thoughts of leadership, um, you know, programming, other things that uh, I know you wanted to have a little bit of time to to have, you know to talk directly to our musicians. Uh, we are running short, but I didn't want to. Um, sort of wrap up before I gave you the chance to sort of direct, you know, maybe direct some thoughts at, at the musicians and or the current and our musicians who are on on the line right now. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I've covered a lot of it, but I guess, you know, my, that, that idea that we're in this incredible time, it's, it's horrifying on so many levels, but it's also the once in a century opportunity to, to change and grow rapidly. And our industry needs it so deeply. It needs, it needs this kind of thinking that, that your generation is going to bring to the table. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that, that, that for me, the things that we could accomplish here, I talked about living by our values, orchestras and, and cultural institutions, we've been doing the work that needs to be done in our country uh, to have connected communities. It's, it's 
we're doing the work that in some places, you know, is obviously done by the government, but these nonprofits have kept our sense of what it, what it means to be from a city, what it means to be, uh, uh, you know, a Louisvilleian, a New Yorker, uh, an American. That cannot be underestimated, it can't be overestimated, whatever the right term is, but it's, it's so critically important. Uh, and right now, you know, we, we, we move farther and farther away from recognizing the, the power of what we, we can do in, in, in our communities. I think we've, we've often, you know, gotten into the weeds on, on what orchestras might be. I think administrations talk about this a lot. Maybe the musicians talk about it internally to some extent, but the industry as a whole has been tethered down. Uh, and it's, it's time to say that like any industry, Innovation, new thinking, trying things is the only way forward. And uh, in franchising our, our members of, of, of the orchestras and franchising the mus musicians that you have a creative voice at the table is going to be key. If you all feel like you have to wait around for other people to make decisions that affect your lives and your creativity, it will just create another cycle of this disenfranchisement, this sense of it's a job, it's part of a system. Instead, you, you are the owners of this system. You are the citizens of, of these communities who have this sworn job to bring your art form to the people in any form. And we have to recognize what that means in America in 2020. We have to recognize that that means going way outside our comfort zones, that where the people are, are not in the places we're used to playing. I mean, using technology or playing in, in, in places that are totally outside the, the, the expectations, the comfort zone, is going to be a way forward. And as I say, you know, if you want to build new audiences and new connections, then you need to treat it like a political campaign. The only way to convince people, the only way to change hearts and minds is to go and actually find them. I believe this so wholeheartedly. There is no amount of philosophizing that you can do you can't, you can't just tell people in the void that this music is important for them or that it's, that it's great or it's meaningful. You have to go find them and you have to show them. Uh, it's this, this you know, great Leonard Bernstein and Ned Roram story about uh, this interaction where they had where, where um, Ned Roram was trying to say to Lenny, he said, the problem, Lenny, is that, that you just want to meet every single person and you can't meet every single person. And for a long time, I thought, that's a weird comment. What does that even mean? And I realized Leonard Bernstein was convinced that because of his passion and his charisma and his belief in the power of this art form, that he believed if he could just meet everyone, they'd all believe in it too. He knew that. He was so convicted of that. And that's, that's the mentality that we all need to adopt, that if we could just meet everyone, if we could just play it for them, the music that, that we know is so powerful and, and resonates with us, we could convince them. But if we don't find them where they are, and that means embracing every possible way of, of, of reaching these folks, then we really don't have a shot. While we, all we will do is play in the echo chamber. And it's wonderful that our echo chamber sometimes have four or 5,000 people in it per season when you add our subscribers and our single ticket buyers. But if you're in a city of, of 10 million people plus or 1 million people plus, you're not cutting it to take the name of, of the city in, in the name of your orchestra, to take the Louisville Orchestra and call yourselves Louisville Orchestra, as opposed to the, the 5,000 people of Louisville Orchestra, you've got to at least try every year to reach everyone. And, and set aside all the traditions about why you couldn't do that, why that wasn't possible. In this era, all the, the possibilities, all the rules are, are, are malleable. Nobody's telling you how to think or what to do anymore because you can propose any idea. And for the first time since I've been in this industry, people won't laugh at it. They won't say, oh, we don't do that. Or no, the union will never agree to that. For the first time, they'll say, that's a great idea. Let's see. And, and this isn't just institutionally. This is, this is individually too. Um, this, this is not limited to people already involved in, in big orchestras. But I will say from the perspective of big orchestras, this, this thinking is so desperately needed because the ground is lava right now. As I said, we can build things uh, and we can try things. And, and as creatives, we mustn't be afraid to fail. I know that people say that all the time, but I can't tell you how much of the, our, the orchestra world is built around fear of failure. 
We play in a way that's built around fear of falling flat on our face in the solo. We, we present music in a way that makes it maximally comfortable. We, we, you know, everything is about comfort. And, and we have to just get, get away from that. That's such a modern idea. If you look at the, the situation people were performing under in previous centuries, when we decided you know, the musical gods lived, it was eminently uncomfortable and weird. And you look at the kind of work Beethoven had to do to get his performances out there. You know, there, there was that weird period where that you could only really present your own orchestral works in Vienna in between like November and December. There was some bizarre uh, seven or eight week period when you could do benefit concerts either for yourself or for the troops or whatever you wanted to do. And the rest of the time, all the musicians were assigned to whatever noble paid them throughout the year. Because you know, people were at their summer palaces, their winter palaces, whatever it was. There weren't you know, Vienna Philharmonic playing in, in, in Mozart's time that didn't exist. Beethoven was hustling. Mahler was hustling. These people were hustling. And as great as they, they were, and lucky they were to, to, to be in a time without maybe some of the distractions that we have, we, we have to hustle too. And we, none of us should be afraid to advocate for what we believe in. None of us should be afraid to, to put ourselves out there um, in a, from a marketing perspective, and none of us should be afraid to raise money. Beethoven had to ask his patrons for money. So did Mozart. So did Mahler. It was, it was the way back then. We know Bernstein did it on behalf of the New York Philharmonic and behalf of his own projects. It's the way of the future. Um, and, and don't let anybody tell you that the artists don't participate in that. We absolutely participate in that. The better you are at doing that, the more, not only just work, but the more options you'll have as, as creative artists. And uh, this is the era to try that. I am so excited about what's possible because I've waited for this, this moment. It's come at, uh, at a horrible cost. It's come at an atrocious cost. And, and sadly, we've decided to, to pay interest on the cost. You know, we, we, it was bad enough for several months. We've decided just to make it even worse collectively. But the realities are the, the, the moments of crises and the moments of, of great cultural shifts are those times when our crazy ideas suddenly become the realistic ideas. And uh, just you know, speaking from, from that place, of, of positivity and optimism, this is the time to do it. Um, and this is the time to, to, to follow whatever your wildest and, and maybe least practical concepts that you believe in might be. So I guess this is my, that's my very broad motivational speech. It's, it, this is not, don't, don't, don't give up. Um, just because the pathways have had, that, that were comfortable and easy before have shut. And we are looking at, yes, I understand dire, financial situations, really scary times ahead. Don't give up because the power of what we do uh, is, is permanent. It's, it's, it's eternal. And our ingenious ways of, of getting that out to people and of, of being our, our, our brilliant and inspiring selves in, in whatever format we come up with, not being afraid to fail, not being able to invest in a big idea, those will serve us very, very, very well uh, in the future, whatever that future might be. Frankly, I, I just kind of end, end this with saying, I'm not a fatalist in that I don't believe that this is all prescribed and we're just in the simulation. Maybe we're in the simulation, but, but I don't believe that we need to just be in the simulation waiting to find out our fate. We actually are writing it right now. And it's like, it's just like Hamilton. You want to be in the room where, where it happens. You know, you want to be there deciding what, what the next generation and the next era looks like of, of creative and performing arts, because we have that opportunity. So I guess this is all to say, don't despair. Um, you know, look inwards to your, your creative potential. It's what um, Dr. Lawler said, to go back to what I always say, that creativity is not taking something that you want and making it what you have. It is taking something that you have and making it what you want. My favorite thing that he would say, uh, and I think that if ever there was the era when that makes so much sense, and you realize, oh my God, yes, that's exactly what, what, what we can do at a time like this. It's right now. So that's my, that's my stump speech. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's fantastic. Thank you. I, unfortunately, we're at the end. We're out of time now. Um, but it's been so inspiring and great to speak with you and, have, and great to have you speaking with our our fellows we really greatly appreciate your, you taking the time and sharing your thoughts and sharing your 
your passion and your knowledge um, with our musicians and with our audience. So, um, Teddy, we can't thank you enough. We really well, thank you, and and for all the uh, the, the fellows uh, this year or last year. If anybody has anything that I can help with, you know, personally, you're welcome to reach out and and you know keep the conversation going. Or if I could provide any advice or, or anything, really, please consider me a resource. I, I wish I could have been there in person to have those those sessions and talk about that stuff. But I, I, I leave that open ended because I know how tough it is for everyone, especially in, in your generation. And uh, I really want, I want to help if there's anything I can do. Well, thank you for saying that. And I know that they will have a chance to work with you very soon. I hope. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, just a reminder that we have a survey after this um, call completes, please uh, fill out the survey. It will really help us for the future. And thank you all for joining us. Teddy, thank you. Kristen, thank you for setting this up. Everyone, have a great day. Take care.